Okay. Uh, well, thanks, Michelle. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Behind the CV, where we hear life stories from faculty uh, about their path through academia. And today we're joined by Professor Anjan Chatterjee from the Department of Neurology here at Penn. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. Um, by, uh, just to start with, I have a disclaimer, which is my days typically start at five in the morning, and this is the nadir of my uh, degree of mental agility, which means that I may say things I will regret. Uh, it means that when you ask me questions, I may um, not be as diplomatic as I might otherwise manage to be. So um, hopefully your editing staff will be uh, more diplomatic and have the kind of executive function I might not have right now. So uh, having said that, uh, what I thought I would do is first, I'm just gonna go through the facts of my life and then go back to it uh, and talk about this uh, in the context of three themes. So the facts of my life uh, are that I was born in India. When I was one year old, we moved to Boston. Uh, my father uh, was a physician and he was doing uh, post doc kind of work in Boston. When I was five, we moved back to India. I lived in a city in the Western part of India for most of that time uh, called Ahmedabad. Uh, and then when I was just shy of 15, we moved back to the US and I went uh, this was in kind of north, northish, uh, north central New Jersey. Uh, I went to a large public uh, kind of urbanish high school in Union, New Jersey. Uh, and then I went to college outside of Philadelphia at Haverford College. I was a philosophy major over there. I took a year off after college uh, and uh, for a while, I worked as a child care worker for what at the time used to be called uh, emotionally uh, disturbed children. I don't know what the right term is right now, but most of them were basically inner city kids that had experienced a lot of uh, psychological, sometimes physical uh, deprivational trauma. Uh, and they were, there was a tough crowd. Uh, and then I also for a while worked in a law firm downtown right off of Rittenhouse Square. Uh, this was, uh, I worked on the Three Mile Island case. Uh, a few years ago, I, I, I queried people in my lab and I was shocked that many people had no idea what Three Mile Island was. Uh, so if there are people <clears throat> listening who don't know, this uh, happened in 1978. Uh, it's a nuclear power plant close to Harrisburg and it was the largest uh, nuclear uh, accident that happened up until that point, uh, you know, before Chernobyl uh, took over that spot. But at the time there, even when I was uh, at Haverford, uh, there was there was real talks about how we might need to evacuate uh, if there was a serious nuclear fallout. So anyway, I worked on that. Uh, I worked on that um, on a law firm that uh, dealt with that. And then I was a med student here at Penn. Uh, after that, I did my medical internship at the Medical College of Pennsylvania, uh, which um, <clears throat> for people who have been uh, in Philadelphia for a long time, this used to be known as women's medical. Uh, it's a real tragedy that this institution uh, folded. Uh, it was at the turn of the, you know, between the 19th and 20th century, it was one of the only, if not the only, all women's medical schools in the country. Uh, and so for the beginning of the 20th century, the, the much of the medical leadership in the US that were women came out of that institution. And so it feels, uh, it, 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 it was a, a moment of sorrow when uh, it got swallowed up by, um, by medical economics in Philadelphia. Um, after that, I went to, I did my residency at the University of Chicago. Uh, I was there for three years. I did one year of a fellowship <clears throat> at Case Western Reserve. I did, uh, I did two years of a fellowship at the University of Florida in Birmingham. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, University of Florida. And then I started my first faculty position in 1992 at the University of uh, Alabama in Birmingham. Uh, and then in 1999, uh, Penn was starting a center for cognitive neuroscience uh, 
for uh, those of you interested in pen history. Uh, at the time, uh, Judy Roden was the president of the college, who was a psychologist, and uh, Bob Barchi was the chair of neurology, uh, but, but, but he was uh, transitioning to becoming the provost at the time. And so when I was being recruited, he was, uh, he was the chair of neurology, but I think he <clears throat> and, uh, and Judy Roden uh, decided to do something that combined neuroscience and psychology, and that's how the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience was started. Uh, at the time, it was uh, Martha Farah and Mark Desposito were the faculty members. Uh, uh, Mark, is, uh, who's now at Berkeley, is someone who I knew, and he had basically called me and tried to recruit me to come here. Uh, Sharon Thompson Schill was a postdoc uh, right before then, once I got here. She was faculty. Mark moved on to Berkeley, and so basically the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience was the three of us, uh, which has, uh, in the last 20 plus years, has grown tremendously, but those were kind of the early days. Uh, and then, uh, so I've been here since 1999. Uh, other uh, notable uh, periods are from 2013 to 2018. I was the chair of neurology at Pennsylvania Hospital. And uh, 2018 on, uh, I left that chair position and started the Penn Center for Neuroaesthetics. So those are the facts. Uh, it doesn't give you much of the flavor. Uh, and so to kind of to get into the flavor and the funk of all of this, uh, I want to do this in, in, in the context of three themes. Uh, and the themes are going to be the choices you make. Uh, the second is uh, dealing with fate. Uh, colloquially, you can think of that as shit happens. Uh, and uh, the third is is people, people, why people are important. So, and with each of these, I will uh, uh, mention three points uh, that were relevant in my trajectory. Uh, and I'm really hoping that this stimulates conversation. Um, I was, uh, before the recording started and before many of you probably got on here, I was uh, mentioning how it can be tiresome talking about yourself. Uh, so I'd rather answer questions than go on and on, blather on about myself. Okay, so choices. We all are faced with choices. And the big picture uh, here is that you just have to own your, own your choices. And the reality is that you will never ever know if your choices are the right ones or the wrong ones because the only way to know that is to live out some period of both choices and you can compare them and you're never gonna be able to do that, right? So you make your choices and you know, there's never, there is never a wrong choice as long as you've done your due diligence up front because you don't know how the alternatives would have played out. So uh, there, there are several, uh, uh, I'll mention three key points uh, where I had to make a choice, which is I mentioned that I was a philosophy major as an undergrad. And for me, a big choice was whether to go on to philosophy graduate school or go on to medical school. Uh, and it's an imponderable, the life, uh, the life of if I had gone on to philosophy or if I uh, would, I have no idea what that would be like, whether I would be much happier than I am or if I'd be miserable, you just don't know. Having said that, once I got to medical school here at Penn for the first two years, I was completely miserable. It was terrible. I mean, I thought this was the worst thing I could have done. Uh, medical school is, uh, ha was at the time, I think it probably still is to some extent, but it was hierarchical. It's anti-intellectual. Uh, I tell, I, every time I tell people who come to my lab who want to go to med school, I give them this uh, this uh, song and dance. I've never ever managed to convince someone not to go to medical school. Uh, so, but it's it was basically uh, it's it it felt after having been at a liberal arts college studying philosophy, it felt like the most anti-intellectual environment that one could be in. Uh, it was just memorize a bunch of facts and spit it back out. Uh, the uh, the, the environment was uh, not 
particularly egalitarian. Uh, and I won't even go into uh, some of the kind of behaviors that were common in the medical environment back then that would not be tolerated right now. So uh, I was miserable, but that was a choice I made. And at the same time, among the closest friends I made were in that period. Uh, we recently, a, a very close group of friends, uh, one of them who uh, was the assistant medical commissioner uh, of Philadelphia uh, last December, um, a year ago, December, uh, died suddenly. Uh, and so we, uh, a few months ago, we had a memorial and all of these friends from 40 years ago came back. And uh, just to, uh, to point out that <clears throat> while it was a choice that around which I was very miserable, it was, uh, it also brought me in contact with people who I care about very deeply uh, and a relationship that has persisted now for 40 plus years. Um, the second choice was uh, once I uh, knew I wanted to do neurology is what kind of neurologist uh, did I want to be? And I found that the main thing I was interested in was cognitive neurology. Uh, there was a way in which this brought me back around to my interests in, uh, my interests in philosophy, uh, sort of questions of how the mind works uh, uh, as framed. Uh, through a biologic lens uh, seemed appealing. It seemed like the most interesting thing one could possibly study. Uh, but at each point at Penn, uh, so if you go back, this is now uh, the early 80s, in general, most neuroscience programs, and Penn was certainly uh, of that ilk, that it was as though there was no nervous system uh, above the neck. Uh, everything was about neuromuscular uh, problems and anything that was cognition was regarded as too soft, too fuzzy. Uh, the zeitgeist at the time was if you wanted to be taken seriously as a scientist, uh, you should be doing molecular biology or protein chemistry uh, or immunology. Uh, again, I was a med student here from 81 to 85. Uh, in 1981 is when we first started hearing about AIDS, and by 85, it was like a huge pandemic, right? This was the thing at that time, if you wanted to be a scientist, you should be studying. Uh, and so uh, cognitive neurology was regarded as a bad idea, and uh, my uh, people here, uh, very well-meaning people, uh, really told me that this was uh, kind of a version of career suicide. Uh, but, you know, you make your choices and, and then you live with it. And so far, uh, it has uh, it has been uh, it. Again, I, I don't want to say that if I had decided to study immunology that I wouldn't it wouldn't be great. Uh, but I don't know that I would have the passion I have for it uh, in the way that I do for cognitive neurology. A uh, third choice was while I was a UAB, um, things were going really well. Uh, I enjoyed my time there. I had a close group of friends. The research was going well. Uh, and when, uh, when Mark uh, Desposito first called me to say, hey, do you want to come and join this thing? My first reaction was, why would I want to do that? I'm perfectly happy. Everything is great. Why would I, why would I leave uh, a happy life uh, to go, uh, go back to Penn? Uh, mind you, remember, as a med student, I was not particularly happy here. So there's, uh, uh, you know, that was part of the question. I love Philadelphia. I've always loved Philadelphia, even back in the really the dark and dreary, gritty days of Philadelphia. Uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, so that was another uh, question of, is this worth it? Uh, is it worth coming, uh, coming back to this department? Uh, and it's, uh, you know, this is going to be a broad generalization, but I think it's generally true that the more, the better the academic reputation of a program, the more the complicated egos that you have to contend, contend with while you're there. Uh, and that's a question of, do you want to deal with that or not? Uh, and just by way of example, within the first year and a half that I came here in 1999, in my department, there were three suicides. Uh, and thinking, 
you know, part of it was, oh my God, what have I done, <laughs> right? If, if this is an environment that, that uh, predisposes people, fact, there was two faculty members and a postdoc uh, that predisposes uh, to people wanting to end their lives, maybe this is not the right place. Uh, but, you know, again, uh, you know, you, you make your choices uh, and, and you live with it and you own them. Uh, and so uh, just to point out that things, things are never quite as straightforward as you would like them to be. So those are, those are at least examples of the kind of choices you make and, and how they might or might not play out in the way you would like them to. Uh, but since you can't live the alternative, you are never in a position to judge whether it's the right choice or not. So you might as well forget that even as a question. Okay, second uh, is the, you have to just deal with fate. Uh, and this is a message that of course, everybody understands given the last two years, right? Nobody had knew the pandemic was gonna come and the way it's disrupted all of our lives, our professional lives, our personal lives, everything about our lives. Uh, and, uh, and that's a particularly dramatic example that I think makes this obvious uh, to everybody. I do wanna point out one thing, uh, which is that anybody you know professionally who is successful, if they do not acknowledge the amount of luck that is involved in being successful, they, in my opinion, they are either lying to themselves or they're lying to you. Um, the, uh, the, in my case, uh, just some examples of things that were completely out of my control that, uh, that uh, had an impact on what I ended up doing. So when I was uh, thinking of going to medical school, my initial plan was that I would uh, enroll in what was regarded as, I think I can't remember what it was called, but it was kind of like a national health service uh, program where uh, the government paid for your four years of medical school, and then for four years, you provided them service. And at the time, the service was either in uh, kind of inner city urban environments, or it was in very rural areas. And I was always a city kid, and this idea of service and service to, a, uh, it, to inner city uh, environments was very appealing to me. And I thought I had a plan worked out. I was no longer going to have to go to my parents and ask for money, take loans, everything. I felt, I felt cool as shit. I was, you know, all mature, and I was going to take control of my life. Well, um, Ronald Reagan got elected president, uh, and one of the first things he did was eliminate that program. Uh, and so it, this was part of his whole kind of trickle down approach, which is if we train enough physicians, that they would end up at those places anyway. So, uh, so all of a sudden I didn't, uh, I had no plan. Uh, but what that did mean is that once I got to uh, medical school, um, everything was up for grabs. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, so it, it meant that I could then discover neuroscience. Uh, back then there was almost no neuroscience in undergraduate uh, classes uh, and and found that there was this body of knowledge that, uh, that, that I really wanted to learn and I enjoyed learning. Uh, but again, that was, so something that was completely out of my control, uh, which is Ronald Reagan being uh, elected has completely determined the trajectory of my career. Um, the second thing was uh, where, and this is a little bit of fate, uh, but I, I probably played uh, some role in this, was that, uh, that uh, I, I was not a very good med student. Uh, I was a mediocre at best, uh, that would be generous. Uh, and it just turned out at that time in our med school class, for whatever reason, there were a lot of people who were interested in neurology. Uh, in a class of about 240 people, there were six of us who went into neurology and most of the, the other people had more research experience. I had zero research experience at the time. Uh, and there was really only one program I wanted to go to, which was a program in Boston where 
uh, there was uh, uh, a man named Norman Geschwind, who was the kind of the father of cognitive neurology in America. Uh, and he was the only person I wanted to study with. Uh, and I did not match in that program. Uh, in fact, one of my best friends, uh, one of these people who I mentioned, we got together a few months ago, uh, uh, who was interested in neuromuscular, right? ends up getting into this program, which was the premier and the only real program for cognitive neurology. But not only that, uh, this week, uh, for those of you who follow Twitter, it's been match week for many people and people announce where they match. I interviewed at a bunch of places and uh, there was only one program I really didn't like and I didn't even rank that place. I did not match at any program. And so all of a sudden, uh, here I was where the only thing I wanted to do as a medical student was to be a neurologist and nobody wanted me. Uh, so that was a moment of existential crisis. Uh, it turned out that the one program I didn't like, uh, it turned out that they really liked me. Uh, and so their program director called me uh, and this was at the University of Chicago uh, and said, do you wanna come? Uh, and at that point, uh, you know, I sort of a little bit chagrined my tail between my legs, I, uh, cause I figured I'm gonna get in somewhere. Uh, I ended up going there uh, and, and that turned out to be a good experience. I loved Chicago. Uh, the University of Chicago was cut in exactly the same mold as Penn was uh, in the sense that the people there kept telling me, don't do cognitive neurology, this is not serious, right? If you wanna be taken seriously, you shouldn't do this. So, but anyway, so I didn't match and that was, uh, that was tough. Uh, and then the other thing was when I was ready to apply for faculty positions, so this was in the early nineties, uh, the zeitgeist in the country had not changed yet where it was still, cognitive neurology was not something taken seriously. Uh, and so if I wanted to do this as a, uh, as a career, um, it, and I was at the time about as well trained as one could be. I had done one year of dementia fellowship at Case Western Reserve uh, with someone who was quite prominent in the world of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I did a fellowship at the University of Florida with the person who was probably the most prominent cognitive neurologist at the time. Uh, uh, and, uh, but there were only two jobs in the entire country uh, for what I wanted to do. And one was at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. The other was at the University of Kentucky. Uh, now, all of my friends from the Northeast and from Chicago were horrified, right? There is a kind of uh, sort of Northeast inflation of self-worth that is pervasive. Uh, and this idea that you would live in Birmingham uh, was just, um, uh, was anathema to many people uh, from uh, this uh, part of the world. Um, but that was the reality. I had no, no, uh, no alternatives and I did uh, choose UAB uh, as a fantastic medical school. Uh, I would say the hospital was better run than any academic hospital I've been in. Uh, that includes uh, Penn's hospital, includes, uh, includes the University of Chicago's hospital, includes Case Western Reserve. Uh, I mean, it just, uh, the, the medical uh, care there was extraordinary. Um, but, uh, you know, but again, those were, uh, those were things that were not in my control. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it wasn't until fMRI came on the scene, which was several years later, that cognitive neurology, cognitive neuroscience became a thing, I think for the wrong reasons, but it became a thing. Uh, so, so that's about uh, the way in which there are things that happen outside of your control uh, in the world at large that, uh, that can have a profound impact on what, what the choices you can even make. Uh, and so one thing about that is I think it doesn't make sense to, to, it's important to have plans, but you shouldn't grasp them too tightly uh, because you really don't have, uh, you don't really don't have 
uh, the idea of how you your prediction of your own future uh, is uh, uh, doesn't always play out. Predicting the future is just not a uh, it's not something we're particularly skilled at. Uh, and then the final thing I would say is uh, the importance of people in your lives. Um, Every now and then, I think, especially in the last week, I've noticed on Twitter, uh, academic Twitter, people, uh, you know, people love to give advice on Twitter. Uh, and it seems as though uh, my take of it is it's all over the place. There's some really bad advice out there on Twitter. Um, and recently I've been seeing things where people uh, are commenting saying that uh, uh, you should, if you're a grad student or a postdoc, that uh, you don't owe anybody anything, uh, that you should you know, make sure you get yours and move on kind of thing. I personally think that kind of advice is misguided. Uh, I think uh, people matter and uh, this matters in the long arc of your, of your career. Uh, and, and I'd like to give examples of that uh, and think about this in a, in a kind of 360 way, which is think of the people who are uh, above you in some kind of academic hierarchy or experience, uh, the people who are at the same level as, as you and the people who are, uh, who are following you or who are behind you. I think it's super important uh, when you can uh, to choose your mentors. Uh, you know, people don't always have that choice, but I think it's really, really important. Uh, and uh, I have had uh, several very good mentors. Uh, in college, I had a, a, a philosophy professor named Paul Desjardins, who was, uh, had a huge impact on me. Uh, he was someone who was uh, in the Dewey School of Education. He was very pragmatic about it. And one of the things he, uh, I spent one summer, he had a, a cabin farm in upstate New York in the Adirondacks. I spent one summer up there with just a group of five people where uh, we read the Iliad. Uh, we read this uh, one chapter a day uh, and half the day we read it, half the day we did hard manual work uh, except for the two people who were assigned to cook dinner. In the evening, we drank beer and talked about the Iliad. And then, you know, the next day it continued. Um, but his view was that if you want to do good academic work, you can't confine yourself to just the, the academic stuff, that it is helpful to, doing, to be doing things physical things or other things with other with the people who are going to be your academic collaborators. And that made, uh, that made, it facilitated that. I'm getting a feedback, are you, are you hearing that? Okay. Um, anyway, but his whole point was that you had to, uh, that it was useful to build relationships with people outside of academia. Uh, and often if that was, being done in a physical context that that would be very helpful. And that's something I've, I've taken to heart. Uh, in, in Florida, uh, my mentor was uh, a guy named Ken Heilman, who uh, is still active. Uh, he's in his eighties. He's just boundless energy, boundless creativity. Uh, and he was, uh, again, one of these people who uh, served as a fantastic role model uh, of just, just, incredibly creative. And he, he said, he told me one thing which I've taken to heart. I mean, he said many things which I've taken to heart, but the one that I'm going to relay is he, he, uh, he laughed at one point and said, if half the things I end up saying, uh, putting out in publications turn out to be true, it will have been a good career. Uh, and I, it's, a, it's a useful thing, I think, to keep in mind, which is that we you know, the only obligation we have is to try to do the best we can and, uh, and not worry about it at, you know, if 10 years later, nobody can replicate it, or if, uh, you know, if what you <clears throat> think happens to be true is not true. Uh, but, you know, you do the best you can and don't worry about uh, whether this ends up uh, being correct or not. 
Uh, and it gives you a certain amount of, uh, I think, uh, approaching things that way. And I want to be clear, the point is not to be sloppy about your work. Right. The point is that it gives you a certain amount of uh, leeway to say, I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to I have to don't have to know how this is going to play out. Um, I just have to do the best I can. Uh, and if you put a lot of ideas out there, some of them, you know, if some of them end up being right. That's great. Uh, when it comes to colleagues, uh, uh, you know, colleagues often end up being collaborators. And I do think you it's important to choose your collaborators carefully. Uh, it's a little bit like uh, choosing partners, partners in life, but partners in work. And, uh, and I think it makes a big difference uh, of uh, who you end up working with. Do, do the people uh, help you? Do they enhance your own work? Uh, and do you enhance theirs? Uh, and and I, when I say that, I want to be clear, uh, it is not uncommon to find people in academia who treat who treat each other transactionally. It's like, what do you have that I can use? Uh, and what do I have that you can use? I think that is fine as an epiphenomena, but that can't be what drives you to uh, interact with someone. Uh, you know, uh, and so that's all I'll say about that. Choose your collaborators uh, carefully uh, and think of them not as you're gonna do this one study with them because they have a certain kind of technique that you might want, but you might work with this person for the next 10 years, next 20 years, right? So, so it, it's about a relationship. It's about a personal relationship, I think, uh, that uh, under, underpins what is going to work as a professional relationship. Uh, and then, your relationship to your mentees or your students and whatever level you are, you've got people behind you. If you're an undergraduate, there are people in high school. If you're in high school, there are people in middle school, so on and so forth. And I think it behooves you to treat uh, people uh, with respect uh, and, uh, and, and with kindness. The, uh, and this can have unexpected long-term consequences. Um, I mean, right now, I would say it's a peculiar time, and this always happens in times of uh, massive uh, technological development, which is the reality is the people in my lab know a lot, a lot, a lot more about stuff that I don't know a thing about, right? Whether these are kinds of statistical analyses, these are kinds of, uh, um, you know, these are kinds of ways of analyzing uh, fMRI data, way of modeling data. And it, uh, you know, it's probably been, I'd say 20 years since I've actually analyzed any primary data myself. Uh, and these methods have developed tremendously since then. It is not worth my time. And I don't know if I would be capable of it to actually sit down and learn those methods, but it means that you have to trust the people you hire, and there is an exchange there. Uh, and, uh, and so I think that's important to recognize. Uh, but even in other little ways, uh, so uh, I could give an example of, um, you know, I met a, a, a Spanish graduate student at some of these early aesthetics meetings uh, that I was going to in the early aughts, who seemed very bright. And, you know, we developed uh, a nice friendship. And uh, I had no idea that he was going to go on to become uh, a rising superstar. Uh, but, you know, a few years later, he asked me if uh, he uh, is from Mallorca, uh, in Palma, Mallorca, and he asked me if I wanted to come there for three months as a visiting prof. And I had never taken a sabbatical. Uh, I mean, in med medicine, people typically don't do this. It was, had been there doing this stuff for 20 years, hadn't taken sabbatical. I thought, well, Mallorca, yeah, maybe. But it turned out I could take a sabbatical. And that was also the context in which I decided, okay, now if I'm gonna go to Mallorca, I need to do something, at least to say I'm doing something. Uh, and that's when I decided, let me write a book. And so I wrote the, the, the book, I wrote a book called The Aesthetic Brain. Uh, I spent that time in Mallorca and then some time in Vienna and Copenhagen, but it was, uh, and, but what ended up happening was 
as part of my being there, the same person, his name is Marcos Nadal, also invited a bunch of other people to come for, uh, for these workshops in, in uh, empirical aesthetics as this field was taking off. And what ended up happening was that we had a small group of, I'd say about half a dozen people that became very close uh, and have internationally worked together uh, for the last decade to really try to nurture a new field. And all of this came about from having pleasant, nice interactions when this at the time was a, a, a graduate student uh, that has uh, the impact of that ended up me writing a book and having a group of very close international people who, um, uh, who have really nurtured this field. So I, I, I claimed that I didn't want to blather on for a while, but fortunately I have. So I'm going to shut up now and take any questions. Well, thank you so much for this incredibly rich uh, presentation and synthesis. I, I, so I'll remind people, if you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand. You can type in the chat if you'd rather um, we just read it out. Oh, and in the chat, there is a plug for the book already. So there you go. Um, let me ask you one first. So I, I really like the theme uh, in the beginning about owning your choices. And I'm wondering how, how did you do that when you were in a position where you're going through two years where you, you thought, oh, this is terrible. I mean, in a sense, you're thinking, well, I made it. I, I can't live the other path. But did, were you not at the same time thinking, geez, surely that you know, anything would have been better. This it could it can't be worse than this. And so how, how do you kind of bring yourself to own your choice when you find yourself in that situation? Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's sort of a do you cut your losses and when do you cut your losses uh, kind of question? Uh, or is it are you kind of in a sunk uh, cost fallacy? Right, Lou? Uh, and so it's a, it's a hard thing to uh, to answer. I think there were two things that kept me from bailing. Uh, one was, uh, as I said, I met a very close group of friends and we were uh, very supportive of each other and that was helpful. Um, and the second was that uh, once we got to the clinics, uh, when we weren't doing the classroom stuff, I found that I actually liked uh, being around patients. I liked, uh, I liked the application and I wouldn't even say the application of the knowledge because at least at the time, the way med school was being taught, much of the knowledge uh, had had a very poor uh, was it didn't bear very directly on patient care, uh, and so. Uh, but I but I found that I liked uh, I liked both the problem solving uh, aspect of medicine, which is what neurology is very good at. Uh, and the kind of caring for people and the, the, the you know, you, it, it, is, it is an enormously privileged role to have because people, uh, you, you get to see people in crises and get a sense of what their life is like and they are more revealing to you in that role than they might not otherwise be. And so those things uh, were sustained me. Which was also a time where, you know, I mean, just to remind people, this was before there was limited hours, uh, you know, during a residency, for example, on average, we worked about 110 hours a week. So. Wow. Uh, um, Michael, did you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. So it's so actually a lot of what uh, we said actually really resonated. Uh, with me uh, from your story. But I think one thing that I'm curious about, so the part about where you said one of your old mentors had said like that um, like it doesn't have to be perfect, like sort of do your best. And, and, I, and I really like that approach. And I feel like that's sort of my philosophy for how I try to do science. But I feel like especially now in the era of the replication crisis and like people freak out about that or people freak out about like, oh well, yeah, like what if what if I say something and it's wrong? <laughs> like, I mean, I don't know. I feel like you have to do your best, like design the studies, interpret the data that's there and tell the story that the data is telling. And yeah, maybe it'll like, do your best to have it hold up. Maybe it won't. But like, how do you overcome those, uh, the people who are so worried about that, that I feel like that just holds back the science of everything has to be perfect before you can put it out in the world. But how do you 
uh, how are you able to overcome that pushback, I guess, in your work? Um, I mean, yeah, I don't know that I have anything particularly profound or insightful to say. You do the best you can and you align yourself with really smart people. Uh, I think one of the things I try to do in my lab is have people in-house be very critical of each other uh, without being personal. Because uh, you want to make sure that once the stuff goes out, it's the best version of what you can do. Uh, nobody in my lab works in isolation. Uh, I think that's not a good way of doing things. Uh, and I think, uh, I, you know, I think you, um, it's sort of like, uh, you know, to use a, a kind of, uh, I don't know, martial arts metaphor, right? You want, you want to do you want to get beat up by your friends and practice before you go out to compete. Right? Uh, and, and, and this is where I think sometimes <clears throat> social media and Twitter, uh, for example, can be harmful because there is a kind of echo chamber about this stuff. And a, a, a sort of, I find sometimes a, a, a sort of hysteria about it uh, that uh, I think can be, um, can be, um, can be inhibiting uh, uh, in a way that I think is not useful. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. So, so Angela asks in the chat here about collaborators. Um, wh what do you look for in a collaborator and do you find that your most successful collaborations have anything in common? Um, Okay, this is going to sound a little bit like a, a, a facile answer, uh, but it's not. Uh, I want to know that I can go out and have a beer with them uh, and, and enjoy myself. Uh, that is unnecessary, but not a sufficient condition uh, to have a, a collaborator. Um, I mean, I want to like them, basically. Uh, you know, I mean, certainly I have friends who don't drink, so I, I don't want to be very concrete about this. But, uh, but it, the, the idea is that you want to, you want to enjoy their company. Uh, and, and this goes back a little bit to uh, my philosophy mentor of, like, you want to be able to enjoy things you're doing outside of academia, and then that makes the academic work more e uh, occur more easily. I mean, that, like everybody, you know, sometimes you have one-off collaborators because there's a very, and even though I don't like this in general transactional thing, like someone may have a very specific technique that you need to answer a question, right? And that's the only person you can, so, you know, I acknowledge all of those realities, but when you have the choice and when you're thinking of, a, you know, of a long-term uh, relationship in collaborators, I, I think uh, it, for me, it's I need to be able to enjoy their company outside of work. Yeah, I, I agree. So much more enjoyable when you, you're actually friends with the collaborators. Um, Nora, did you want to hop in? Yeah, sure. Hi, Anjan. Um, so as someone who also has a background in philosophy, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, sort of the challenges, but also the opportunities that your undergraduate background kind of laid out for you in your future work and current work. Um, well, the immediate challenges uh, I think I mentioned, which is that coming to med school, it was so different. Uh, it was not about uh, it was not about discussing ideas. It was not about uh, sort of pushing your thinking. It was about straight. Can you memorize these facts and spit them out in a completely decontextualized way? So it, that was a, a sense in which philosophy did not help me. Uh, uh, to be a good medical student. Uh, the, I think the ways it helped me was, uh, you know, finding that, the, that what I ended up doing, which is cognitive neurology and being a cognitive neuroscientist, was very aligned with the kinds of questions that, uh, that line themselves up with philosophy. Uh, it also means that I have remained, I've continued to read philosophy through the years, uh, especially when there are topics that are relevant to our research. Uh, you know, I mean, I uh, had a postdoc in the lab uh, from Germany, Gregor, a few years ago, we wrote a paper on uh, the way in which Kant 
is misused in empirical aesthetics, including the way I had written about it before, right? So, but there's, I think there's a kind of comfort of uh, even putting that stuff out there, which, uh, you know, there might be, uh, there might be philosophers who would have jumped all over that paper because we were misinterpreting up misinterpreting our interpretation of Kant not having read him in German, although Gregor has read him in German and all of this stuff. But, but I think that there's, a, there's a, a sort of intellectual freedom and agility that philosophy can give you that lets you, uh, you know, enter in some of those, uh, in, in some of those conversations and draws upon uh, that wisdom in a way that is relevant. Uh, another uh, another philosophy mentor I had as an undergrad is a guy named Richard Bernstein, who then went on to teach at NYU. He also said something that has stuck with me, uh, which is he said that uh, you should read as a scavenger. Uh, and by that, I think he meant that you like you pick out what you want. Uh, and uh, and I think, uh, you know, so that is something that continues. I mean, I'm happy to read anthropology. I'm happy to read linguistics. I'm happy to read uh, you know, I'm happy to read sociology, uh, you know, as long as it, it, there is something that I can extract from that, can scavenge from that, that's going to be relevant to my thinking and how we might design an experiment. You know, I think, I think so studying philosophy gives you kind of a license to do that sort of thing. So I think um, last question goes to Kathy. Hi, John. Long time. Um, yeah, <laughs> still a fan. Um, can you uh, talk a little bit about how your photography practice has developed sort of alongside your career? Huh. Um, all right, so what Kathy is referring to is that uh, over the years I've been um, to varying degrees obsessed with photography. Uh, and the background of this is, uh, you know, growing up in India, uh, we, one of the things we did was uh, uh, we drew a lot. Uh, sometimes I'd go out with friends and we'd spend time just drawing things. Um, and that continued on uh, while I was here in college, I took uh, classes in drawing and sculpture and printmaking. Uh, and uh, so that kind of uh, interest in, uh, in producing visual imagery, you know, started very early. Uh, it all went by the wayside in med school and residency. There just wasn't any time for that. But after that, uh, I switched to, to photography and, you know, spent years uh, doing darkroom photography, kind of self-taught. I took one or two night classes, but mostly self-taught. Uh, and uh, one of the big ironies is that for a long time, I would struggle with, uh, with blankets and bathrooms and trying to deal with all the dust and you know all of that. And then finally, when I moved here uh, and we ha had our own house, I had a dedicated uh, darkroom built in the basement uh, and then two years after that, I went digital. <laughs> so, uh, and just to kind of uh, maintain the illusion of the dark room, I would, you know, set up my laptop and I had a nice, you know, photography printer down there and I would sit in the dark room in the dark doing things uh, until that, that didn't last. But to, to the broader question, I think th there are certain things about photography. It, so in a, in a direct way, it has influenced my desire to study aesthetics. Uh, but I think there are other things about it in a more abstract way, which is that, uh, you know, the, the issues of form and content, the issues of how, uh, how do you take dif disparate elements and try to bring them together in which there is a kind of uh, an internal coherence to that. Uh, how do you then, uh, how do you manipulate the image where you're really trying to get a very specific message across? All of that applies in science, right? All of that applies in science. And I think that uh, that's a way in which I think, uh, you know, every time you write a paper, 
Uh, you can think of that in the same way as you might uh, a photograph. Like what is, what is the main theme here and are all the elements fitting? Is there something extraneous? What do you leave out, right? This is a big issue in science. It's a big issue in photography. Uh, what is the form that you really want to, uh, uh, the, the sort of quality of your writing, uh, you know, that might be the analogous to the quality of, uh, uh, of the, the, the tonal qualities of, of an image. Uh, so I think that the, the ways in which having that kind of uh, practice that really focuses you on the elements with the ultimate goal of having a very specific story to communicate where there are many disparate parts, I think that applies to science as well. I think that Tyler is probably going to wrap us up and I'm going to do the classic academic thing, which is not a question, but <laughs> a comment. Um, first, I would like to encourage you to write that uh, the 100 page version of the monograph because of your life, because I have some quotes here that all I had to write down because they seemed so insightful. Um, can't live the alternative, so might as well forget it. If people don't acknowledge the role of luck, they're lying to you or lying to themselves. Um, and it's important to have plans, but don't grasp them too tightly, which all seemed very wise and perfect for uh, a short uh, autobiographical piece. <laughs> you should do it. I would read it. I agree. And um, yeah, I, I wanted to say thank you, Anjan, for, for doing this. It, I thought this was really insightful and, and really fun. So thanks for taking the time out and sharing your story with us today. Sure thing. All right. Take care.